Hi, and welcome back to The Secret Life of Parkinson's. I'm Jessica Krauser, and if you watched an earlier episode, I'm now still with Stevie B. We don't Happy yet to be here. I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have Brian back yet again, but we Me have Me too. Steve. I know. Yeah. But there's a reason for that, because now we have Dr. Lockton with us. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Dr. Lockton is with Ohio ENT um, and Allergy, and we had previously on before Gina, the speech pathologist, and you two work together. And you've been working with Steve, which is why we have Steve and not Brian. We just don't have any extra chairs or microphones. So, uh, <laughs> um, But thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having us. I'm I appreciate really, it. I'm really excited to learn more because as... I was diagnosed three years ago. I haven't had any experiences yet with voice or speech um, uh, symptoms or issues, but it's always good to learn ahead of time so that we know how to handle them when it does come on. Um, one of the things that I um, stated when we were talking to Gina, the speech pathologist, was that I did not know is that 75% of all people living with Parkinson's do experience voice or speech um, issues at some point along the, the progression of the disease. So again, if knowing that it's in their future, um, it's great to know different things that are, that we can do. So what we're going to talk to you about today, or what you're going to help educate us on are, there are procedures. So we talked to Gina about the exercises that Steve did, mm -hmm. but then there's also procedures that you can yep. do to help yeah. strengthen things. So um, so that's what we're going to go over today. But before we jump into that, um, what are, what do you see? Like when somebody comes into your office, um, a Parkinson's patient or, you know, what are they coming into you for? Yeah. So usually a patient is coming in for, uh, some voice issues. Typically it's problems with projection. So getting their voice loud enough. Or they'll say, my voice is hoarse, meaning the clarity or the crispness of the voice mm -hmm. is difficult. Um, a lot of times there's also some swallow difficulties going on as well. And um, so those are patients, if we're talking about specifically a PD patient who's coming in, um, that's typically what they're talking about. Um, but similarly, uh, you know, we often will see patients who have no prior diagnosis who are coming in for some voice issues, same type of thing, weak voice, or I've lost, um, you know, I've lost range with my singing voice. I'm having some swallow difficulties. Um, who have had no prior diagnosis, and some of you know during the physical exam, some of the telltale um, signs and symptoms of PD are in some of these patients are pretty apparent, and then that leads us to what can sometimes be a fairly uncomfortable conversation yeah. where we're actually the first ones who initiate the discussion of a potential movement uh, diagnosis and getting them um, tied into the neurology team. Um, so, um, Does that it, happen a lot? Yeah, it's, I would not say that that is the, the norm, but I would say it is not uncommon for us as ENT and speech pathology team to be the first ones to bring out a PD diagnosis. Wow, that's kind of a, how I mean, rough a call is that? That's, um, it can be a fairly uncomfortable uh, patient encounter because they're coming in because they think maybe they've got some mucus or some phlegm or something. Mm -hmm. And then I look at, you know, I see maybe like a resting tremor or I see um, kind of mass facies or just the monotonicity of their mm -hmm. voice. And in my head, I'm thinking, I think this person has something else going on. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to break that to them and say, hey, mm -hmm. has anyone talked with you about this? Has anybody kind of said potentially there could be something else going on? And um, and so it's, and it, Parkinson's is one of the most well-known common neurologic diagnoses, I would mm -hmm. say, in, in the lay population. Mm -hmm. And so, which is really good, but it also, that word, you know, can strike fear into a patient. And so as soon as I drop that, that word, oh, yeah. yeah, as soon as I drop that and I say, it might not be this, but this is what I'm thinking, you know, uh, it can be pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable and pretty scary for those patients. I bet. So then do you turn around and refer them to yeah. like Dr. Patel or? Correct. Or, okay. Yeah. So any, um, interestingly, you know, we see a lot of patients with vocal tremor, so actual tremor and spasms of the voice box that are not um, related to PD, not in the context of another 
diagnosis. It's mm-hmm. called benign essential tremor. Yeah. It's like having just a resting hand mm-hmm. tremor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we sell, we see a lot of patients with that. But for any patient where I'm diagnosing diagnosing a new tremor that nobody else has, I will always start the referral process to the neurologist. Mm -hmm. And typically, I like to get them in with a neurologist who's a movement specialist. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's, like, it's crazy that, you know, again, everybody always thinks that if you have Parkinson's, if you're shaking, like, right, like, or when people see me, they're like, oh, you have Parkinson's, it doesn't look like it. It's like, (laughs) because it's not always visible. Yeah. And so I think it's really interesting that, you know, your people need to pay attention to, you know, their themselves or a loved one, you know, a parent of voice changes. For and sure. that could be a telling sign of something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and oftentimes it's really, really subtle, um, the, the tremor, because it doesn't always have to be you know, a classic, really apparent thing. You know, sometimes it's just like we talked about. I can't get my voice as loud as I need to anymore. It takes me a lot more effort to get my voice. I have a shakiness to my voice or I can't hit these notes where I used to. My voice is unreliable. It goes in, it goes out. I get vocal (laughs) fatigue. Towards the end of the day, my voice feels weak or I'm just really, if I have a lot of meetings today or uh, within a day, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm weak at the end of the day. I just feel fatigued. That's the type of stuff that patients will often present with now what can you guys do to help if there is like a fatigue for like an entire day they're doing something and they're just yeah can they ever get back to not being yeah tired or? so um and gina um touched on a lot of this um in her episode where uh, voice therapy exercises mm-hmm. to strengthen your whole system um uh, can be very helpful so like you're talking about working out is a big part of your life mm-hmm. and your regimen and what that helps with as far as your voice is it helps with what's called your um, pulmonary driver your or your pulmonary support your respiratory support mm-hmm. which is all of these muscles here and getting your lungs you know being able to push yeah. um, then the voice therapy specifically helps at the glottic level or the throat level the voice box level Um, And so the mainstay of treatment for any type of tremulous or tremor disorder of the vocal cords is typically voice therapy, physical fitness. Mm -hmm. And then depending on where that goes, then there are some procedural interventions or or procedures that we can do as well. And that's what you have had done or you're going to? Yes, I had an injection done back in June of Mm -hmm. this year. Why did you get... Uh, I wanted to look, I was, I know that the exercises that I was doing were helpful, but I wanted to get an additional boost to my base tones. Okay. And I knew that the injection would do that. So I asked if that would be something that would be possible and, and I was a candidate for it. So an injection of what? So um, it can be a number of different things. The main concept is that it's a filler. It's some sort of filling substance. Mm-hmm. The specific injection that I use is called Restylane. I have full disclosure, I have no financial uh, interests or any sort of uh, thing to disclose about that. I'm not affiliated with Restylane or Galderma or any of the other mm-hmm. companies in any other way. So got to get that out there in <laughs> case they hear this. Yeah. But um, so what I, partic- what I inject is called Restylane. It's actually FDA approved as a facial filler. It's not a, an injection for vocal cords. There are other... Um, injections like prolarin, um, sometimes fat will get injected. Um, there's a whole host of things, but essentially it's a filler. It makes the vocal cords more plump and thicker. And what happens in PD is that those vocal cords um, become atrophied or thin. Mm-hmm. And so um, just like any other muscle in the body uh, with a either with aging process or with lack of use or with movement disorders, you can get a thinning of the muscle. And so the vocal cords themselves are not as robust and it just takes so much more effort to get your voice out. You might have Mm -hmm. air wasting or you're just kind of, you can't speak as long on a breath. Mm -hmm. And so the filler makes them thicker. And so it's easier to get your vocal cords to come together. Um, You can get a tighter seal, get better projection, Mm -hmm. less effort. And it does work. It yeah. works. Yeah. So that was with that was an injection. Right. Is there are there other therapies that you've done or? Yeah, but the injection. I I was fascinated with the procedure that you that you do to do that. I know one thing you told me the 
the numbing will be a nasty taste. Oh, yeah. Numbing number one. For sure. And then number two will be even worse tasting. <laughs> And then number three will be the worst of all tasting. I thought, no, there's no way they could give me anything that tastes any worse than the first, second, but the third was definitely the worst. Yeah. But procedurally, can you describe what you do when yeah. you go in to do that? So there's a couple ways that you can do it. In my hands, um, so I'm what's called a laryngologist. So mm-hmm. a laryngologist is an ear, nose, and throat surgeon who has additional training and expertise in laryngology, which is disorders of airway swallowing voice. Mm -hmm. And um, those type of physicians are um, well-versed in doing a lot of these procedures in an awake patient. So one option is to go to the operating room, go under general anesthesia Mm -hmm. um, and do an injection that way. But I would say in my hands, the vast majority, probably 99%, we just do in the office. And so the patient comes in, um, to the office, we put some numbing and decongestant spray in the nose. We put some numbing spray in the mouth. Um, and then as, uh, Steve had uh, mentioned, none of those taste good whatsoever. Uh, they're bad. And, yeah, they're bad. Um, and actually I always tell patients the worst part of this procedure is the numbing. The numbing takes the longest. It's the most uncomfortable. Um, and then the injection itself is usually, you know, a minute or two. Yeah, so we numb That's actually right. I never thought about that, but that's. Yeah. All true. that, all that setup is the, is the worst. And then the injection minute or two. So numb the nose, numb the mouth. Mm-hmm. And then we actually even further numb the vocal cords themselves. And the way that we do that is we drip a little bit of numbing medication, onto the vocal cords, typically going through the mouth. And then the next step is we use a really small uh, instrument that goes through the mouth, has a very tiny needle on it that deposits the injection into the vocal cords. I'm doing that whole procedure while watching a video screen and Gina, our speech language pathologist, is actually running the scope to show me where we're putting the injection. Gina's like the pilot and I'm like the bomber. And full disclosure to Blake Simpson, MD at University of Alabama, <laughs> for that analogy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and it, it works. Yeah, it sounds scary though. It sounds a lot scarier, I think, than it. And I, I will say this in full disclosure, never having one before. Mm-hmm. But Gene and I together have done uh, somewhere in the order of about three hundred or more injections of different types in awake patients. I would say the vast majority of patients. Uh, afterwards say that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Really? Yeah, but it sounds very scary for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I don't have to try as hard to speak or to hold notes or or project. It it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I can tell even now that I'm not projecting as loud as I was shortly after I had that done. Really? Yeah. So that's why I'm going for the permanent procedure. Well, I'll be interested to see, like, hear, hear the difference. Like, will we will be able to hear the difference from him? So you'll probably be able to hear the difference in terms of projection, which is the volume. Uh-huh. But what I think will be most apparent will be to Steve himself, which yeah. is um, how much effort or uh, lack of effort it's taking to get the same product out. So it'll be a lot of decreased strain, decreased effort on his part, less vocal fatigue. And so a lot of it will be a physical sensation in addition to the voice itself. Because does it make you tired that like you, or do you feel like you're trying a lot? Yeah, I mean, when he first talked about, you know, fatigue, vocal fatigue mm-hmm. at the end of a day, I do feel some of that. Uh, and I originally, when I started back up doing my exercises, I could tell by the end of each exercise that I, I'd done it, hmm. you know, so it, it makes a difference. They come back quickly though. Yeah. So it you worked. Know. What did it help you do? Project your voice more? Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, it was so much easier to talk. Okay. You know? So it was like uh, less effort for you to... It's like I used to be, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, after a week or two of hoarseness, I mean, because you have you know, you have to heal, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I mean it. How did often a great do you have to do that? Me. Well, what once every three to six months or after? Yeah, so I would say um, that injection that what I use the Restylane, which is called hy- hyaluronic acid. It's a gel. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, that is absorbed by each person's body at a little bit different rates. So some patients' okay. body will kind of eat it up really quickly, and then some will eat it up slower. And so usually what I tell patients is typically in my hands about three to six months is what to expect. I would say most of my patients get around four months of benefit with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at that point, injections can be continued. Uh, there's really not a limit to the injections. Um, and Or there are some, some other options. Um, as there are some permanent options that sometimes patients will consider as well. And that's what I've chosen. And I think, the permanent uh, option. Yep. Here in a couple months, we're going to have that done. And, and I mean, I could go ahead and do the injections, but I'd rather just do it once and yeah. not worry about it yeah. anymore. Um, anything that you want to share? Just that I'm looking forward. Standpoint. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to the permanent uh, operation. Yeah, I think and it's going to make a big difference. And that, um, you know, briefly, that operation what we do is make a small incision or a small mm -hmm. um, cut in the skin over the neck, and we actually open up a little tiny window, a little hole in the voice box itself. And we put a little shim, basically, um, a little placeholder, and that shim is actually Gore-Tex. And you might have heard of that from, like, coats or clothes or, mm -hmm. you know, it's from NASA. I think they did some – I think that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. But um, in the late 1980s or early 1990s, these um, uh, surgeons thought, hey, we use it in hearts. Why don't we just put this in voice boxes? And that's kind of how it started. And so. Wow. You put its little shim of Gore-Tex and kind of plump up the vocal cord and make it a little bit thicker, move it a little bit towards the middle, and it has the same effect as the filler, but a permanent because mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not absorbed. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> do, good, do a good job. But no, we'll have to, um, we'll, we'll have you back on. Maybe we'll have Brian on here too and we can talk to you. About yeah. In fact, I may not even need a microphone. You can project, yeah, and we right. can ha hear you sing. Well, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. <laughs> he said he's on a scale of 1 to 10. He said he's great. Yes, I am. <laughs> a lot of patients will say, so am I going to sing really well after this? And my very first question is, did you sing well before this? <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah. Well, my singing ability is matched only by my humility. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank on. you so thank much you for having for me. Thank you for sharing your personal stories too, to as always. That. So, um, in our last thirty seconds, I'll leave you with this: like everything that we've been talking about so far, there are so many different therapies and uh, and medications, things that you can look into if you just consult with your doctor and tell them the situations that are going on. So, as it is with your voice and with your speech, there are many people that are out there that can help you get to a better place so that you can live a better life today. As always, consult with your doctor and we'll see you soon. Thanks.